And you see, John the Apostle was the one that showed us in 1 John chapter 5 that if you come to the place where you trust the word of God, you will embrace it irrespective of the various demands that it will lay on your life. Let's see 1 John chapter 5 from verse 1. 1 John chapter 5 from verse 1. Just stay with me. I want to build gradually. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Let's break it down. Give me NLT. Bring it to NLT so that it's easy. NLT. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become what? And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. So that's what King James was trying to explain with begot and begotten. Next verse. We know we love God's children if we what? And do what? Verse 3. Loving God means doing what? And his commandments are what? Not burdensome. So you come to a point where if God says, I hate this thing, you don't go trying to interpret it, regardless of the expectation that it lays upon you. The expectation of God's revealed will in scripture might lay such a demand upon you that like Peter, after hearing Jesus talk about marriage, you say, Kai, it's better that a man should be single. You, 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 the weight of the expectation upon you becomes revelation to you. But you are still willing to obey because you know that the commandments are not what? God knows what you need. And if he says that this thing is not good for you, he has a reason why. Your ex the expectation he has for you is to submit to that command. And John is saying that your willingness to submit, regardless of the pain of obedience, is proof that you love God. You cannot love God and argue his word. You cannot love God and reject his commandments. So the first lie that Satan told to man is that God cannot be what? Trusted. Go back to Genesis. I think we're in verse 2 now. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit, eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you what? I want you to say die. Next verse. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. There are two implications to this statement. One, he was telling the woman that man had already received eternal life. That death was no longer an option for the woman. He was saying to the woman that you have been exempted from death somehow, probably in assuming or trying or inferring is the word I want to use, that man was already immortal. That eternal life was not something that the woman needed to look forward to, but it was something that she already had. So he said, You will not surely die. The second thing here was Satan was trying to make light of the sentence of disobedience. He was trying to give the woman the impression that if you disobey, death is not a consequence that will actually happen to you. So he was undermining the consequence of death and he was inferring that man already had eternal life. The reason I'm starting here is we need to know what happened to man that resurrection became such a critical matter in the establishing of our faith. Satan said, you will not die. So feel free to disobey God, but nothing will happen to you. You already have life. And this life, nothing will happen to it. Does this sound familiar? You know that there are people now, 
messengers of Satan, I like to call them, who are still carrying this message that once you have made contact with God, you cannot lose your salvation. It's the same thing as saying you will not surely die. Let me give you an example. How many of you have graduated from university? I'm going to ask you a question so be prepared. Don't worry, it's not, um, it's not Laplace theorem. It's nothing serious. Now imagine that as you came into the university campus on the day of your orientation, you know they do orientation, right? They now say to you that, don't worry. See your first class certificate. First class accounting. I say, take. I have given it to you. No matter what you do, you have graduated. Will you read? <laughs> Somebody say, ah! All the, you know what they call Awoko? Awoko. I know the young people might not know Awoko. Do you know Awoko? Where you read all night. Have you ever tried to do a woko and you put your leg inside water and you still sleep? <laughs> Have you bought 500 naira cola? They say cola used to drive sleep. Then you now bought 500 naira and you were eating cola like the way goats eat grass. <laughs> the more you eat the cola, the more you sleep. Have you gone to do all night reading before? And when you are coming from the reading, they say, Bob, you don't read. You are saying, not be smart, you know. <laughs> but you yourself know that. <laughs> the sleep, eh? You slept away your destiny. In fact, if not that God showed you mercy, you should not have woken up. But as you are entering the hostel, everybody say, Bob, you don't finish the course. You say, not be smart, you know. <laughs> now imagine that that was the scenario. Satan came and told them that don't worry about the end. Don't worry about the consequence. It's been sorted out. You will not surely die. So don't, don't, that, what they are telling the average Christian in modern day is don't make effort to know God. Don't make effort to fight carnality. Don't make effort to live holy, regardless of what you do. Stay with me, please, or stay. Hmm? That debt that the Bible calls the second debt, hmm, where the Bible says that those who refuse to live for God, it says that they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is what? The second debt. Satan says, don't worry about the second debt. You are already secured. Don't believe that you will die. You already have immortality. Your soul is already saved. Are you here? Do you know that Jesus, in one of his preaching messages, his messages in scripture, he said that, don't be afraid of them that all they can kill is what? Your body. Okay, let's read it. I think it's Matthew 15. Give me, no, not 15. Matthew 27, give me verse 15. I think so. I think it's Matthew. Ah, uh, no, not here. Let me find that scripture. Hmm. Media, find that scripture for me. Huh? 1028. Is it 10? Okay, let's see 10. Aha. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot what? But rather fear him who is able to destroy what? Both soul and body. Where? So, Satan came to Eve and said, eternal life is secured. Meanwhile, 
if you read through the Bible now, anybody who is telling you that, just live the way you like. You are, you are eternally secured in Christ. That's so, no need to fight the activities of Babylon, the activities of Egypt and Sodom. Just live without obeying God. Don't submit to the Lord's commandment. You will not die. That person is trying to make sure that nothing good comes out of your life. In fact, in the book of Revelation, when we did, I think, I can't remember what series we were doing, I showed you, I think it's the letters of Jesus, that it is him that overcomes that God will give to eat of where? The tree of life. So it means that even now that you are born again, if you do not overcome, if you don't make it to the end, immortality is still not guaranteed for you. Are you here? Or let's read it. Revelation 2 7. Revelation 2 7. You've heard many Easter messages. I'm just trying to establish something in your spirit that we pray. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to who? To him who overcomes. I will give to eat from where? Which is where? In the midst of the paradise of God. Give me Revelation 22, verse 14. Revelation 22 and verse 14. Blessed are they who do what? That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. What's the city there? The new Jerusalem. Are you with me? So, what Satan is promising was, remember that the lure of Satan's evangelism was disobey God. He began by first saying, don't believe what God has said. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Whoever controls your belief system can determine the trajectory of your life. If there is one that controls what you subscribe to, what you believe, that one can determine how your life will turn out. That's what I'm saying. And what Satan first attacked was the word of God. Don't trust the word. So when Jesus says, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And anyone that destroys that temple, the Lord will also, Satan says, is a lie. When God says that he that is joined to a harlot is one body with her, the Satan says, is a lie. When Jesus says that except you repent and turn away from your sin, you will suffer in hell. That that hellfire so is a place where there is gnashing of teeth. Satan says is what? Is a lie. That you can live anyhow. And you will not die. You will not suffer judgment. You know what Satan is also saying? He's saying that the future is not true. You know, I like to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. But tonight, I want to speak about your resurrection. <laughs> when you wake up, what will be waiting for you? That's what I want to ask you tonight. Because whether we like it or not, some of us sitting in this room will be dead before Jesus returns. Do you know that 30, 40, 60 years from now, the stories that will be told about this meeting will be stories of men that have already died? 30 years from now, some people in this room will already be 80. 40 years from now, some people in this room will already be 70 something plus. 50 years from now, some people in this room will be 90, 100, 102 in this room. So many of the stories they'll be telling of this service will be stories of men who no longer exist on the fates of the earth. Many of us would have died. Some at 80, some at 90, some at 100. The question is, when the trump sounds and you are waking to that sound, 
what will be waiting? That's all I want to ask you tonight. So I'm just, I'm just trying to build gradually. If you are still here, say amen. amen. So once Satan was able to undermine consequence, first of all, he attacked the credibility of God. Second thing, he went for consequence of disobedience. He said, you don't have any responsibility to a God you don't trust. <laughs> Are you hearing me tonight? You don't owe him anything. What he's using to hold you is a future that does not exist. You will not die. So you owe him no responsibility. Fornicate. And then come to church and pretend as if nothing happened. Keep telling yourself that you have a weakness and your weakness is pornography. You've tried everything. You can't stop. The minute your wife starts acting strange, pack your bags and say you are tired. After all, divorce is not the will of God, but it's not a sin. Pack out! And just in case, when you pack out, you feel lonely, come on now. Marry another one. And repeat the process over again. When that one starts misbehaving, for God's sake, I've done this shit before. <laughs> Come on now. Pack your bag. Rent another house. Marry another one. After all, hmm, there are many who are like that. Many great men. Some of them are on their fifth husbands. Some of their fifth wives. If those ones have not died, I'm just on my second one. Who are that whole mountain? He said, You don't owe him any responsibility. The consequence he's telling you is a lie. 